Number 3. Hebrews. First quarter, 2022. John Pauline. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We are beginning Lesson 3, The Promised Son, in the quarterly on these last days, the message of Hebrews. Dr. John Pauline is our moderator. Sean will offer our opening prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're delighted today to have you call us into your presence. We thank you that in you all things are fulfilled, and we want to be fulfilled in our living today. We place aside any of the distractions that might encumber that, and ask that as we proceed with the study of Hebrews, that we might well understand how it is that your Son has spoken to us in these last days of your gracious self. Help us to identify who you are more fully today with the capable leadership of John Pauline and the guidance of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you in the name of Christ. Amen. So we're getting into the third in a series of studies on the book of Hebrews. And in the previous session, we were trying to get at the core message of Hebrews, and that seemed fairly attainable. But there were a lot of aspects to the imagery, etc., that gave us some puzzle, some struggle. And I have good news, and the good news is that this session, I think, will kind of blow the gaskets off. This one, I think, will be very relevant and very exciting. At least it was for me. I learned some stuff preparing for this one that never occurred to me before and really has me excited to share. So let's get into it. Going right straight to the handout, number one, it says, For Jews in the first century, the prophetic word of God had not been heard in a long time, not since the prophet Malachi. And now, if you're familiar with the rabbis, they had a concept called the bat kol, which means the daughter of a voice. And it does appear that from time to time, there would be voices from heaven that would just suddenly appear, and and perhaps the high priest or the Maccabean ruler or some other might hear that voice. So there was a sense that God's prophetic guidance was absent, yet God had not abandoned his people, that from time to time he used audible voices to reach them. In that light, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, is very interesting, and I suggest that, Terry, if you would read all four verses first, and then we'll go back and take them one at a time. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. All right, let's start with verse 1, if you'd read that again. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. Okay, it's been noted before, and I think I mentioned it in the previous session, that the author of Hebrews has a skill with the Greek language that transcends the rest of the New Testament. It's truly amazing. And right in the first verse, you get right into that, expressions you would see nowhere else in the New Testament. And in the Greek language, word order and sentence order are two different things. For us, generally, the subject comes first, then comes the verb, and then comes the object, and we know where it fits in the sentence, largely by the order of the sentence. But in the Greek, you don't need sentence order, because in the Greek, each word tells you where it belongs in the sentence. If it's the subject, it's the nominative form. If it's the object, it'll be the dative or the accusative. If it's a verb, that is clear from the form as well. So the Greek language doesn't use word order to express the role in the sentence, which leaves the author free to order the sentence any way he or she likes. And the first word or the first words then are placed first, not because they're the subject, but because they're the primary emphasis of the sentence. And what's fascinating with Hebrews is that it begins with three adverbs. You know what an adverb is? Usually in English, they end with L-Y, you know, joyfully. How did they sing? They sang 
joyfully. It expresses the manner in which the singing took place, etc. So it starts with three adverbs. That's the core meaning. And these three adverbs summarize the whole Old Testament. And they go like this. Fragmentarily, variously, anciently, God spoke. Uh, even though you may not have any sense of the Greek, you can tell just from the English. That's some pretty creative, artistic use of language. And Hebrews is like that. So he summarizes the entire Old Testament in three adverbs. It came to us in fragments. God's revelation was fragmented. It was little bits and pieces as people were able to bear it. It came in many different forms. There were prophecies. There was poetry. There were stories and other narratives. There were histories, etc. So it came fragmentarily, bits and pieces, in many different forms long, long ago. So it acknowledges in these three words that God had not been speaking lately in the way that he spoke before, and that before he spoke fragmentarily and variously. So it expresses the truth about God or the evidence about God like a jigsaw puzzle. It was a pile of little bits and pieces that people would have to put together. But then comes verse 2. But in these last days, he has spoke to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. So God's revelation came anciently, but in these last days, God spoke by a son, who's the heir of all things and the creator. So here we see that what came in the past was fragmentary. It was significant, but it was fragmentary. And now he sends a son. So if you don't mind, I'll stay with the analogy for the moment. When you have a jigsaw puzzle, what do you need to put it together? You need a picture. Usually on the cover, you need a picture that gives you the big idea, and then you could find the pieces and put them in their proper place. And so with the analogy of the jigsaw puzzle, Jesus is like the picture on the cover that gives us the framework in which all the little pieces fit together. Now, we talked last time, does the Old Testament accurately portray God? Is it an adequate revelation? And the answer is yes. It's all there, but it's fragmentary. It's various. It's ancient. There's a lot of reasons why some people might not get the whole picture from that alone. So God now speaks through his son, and often the text will have a capital S. And this son is the heir of everything. He's the creator of everything. And then verse 3 tells us more. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. All right, so here you have an idea. God is going to send a clearer revelation. God is going to send someone straight from the throne, someone who created the world, someone who is the radiance of God's glory. He carries the very essence of God. He's the sustainer of the universe. As we've noted in the past various times, for the Jews, there were four characteristics of God. If you wanted to know the difference between God and creation, it was in four things. God is the sole creator of the universe. God is the sole ruler of the universe. God has a special name, and God is worthy of worship. And if you read through chapter 1 of Hebrews, which we won't take the time to do now, but if you read through chapter 1 of Hebrews, you see all four of those characteristics applied to Jesus. So here you have the great conundrum of God in the New Testament, that God is one, that there is no other but him, and yet that Jesus is clearly included in the one God, yet is distinct from the one God. He is the Son. He is not the Father. So Christians wrestled with this for hundreds of years. How do you put together that God is one? And yet Jesus is part of that one, yet not one in a singular sense. That he is included in the one God, yet distinct from his Father. And so, of course, 
through the centuries that was wrestled out, and the end result was the doctrine often known as the Trinity, which is the idea of God is one, and yet God is three. Does that make any sense in human terms? Perhaps not. But it is attempting to express in human language something that is way bigger than anyone perhaps can understand. So you have this amazing person, this full and final revelation of God comes down. And Hebrews is just saying, this is the decisive moment of history when God himself takes up human flesh and joins us here. In that light, verse 4 is kind of puzzling. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. If Jesus is everything that's been said in verses 2 and 3, why does the author of Hebrews have to say, oh, by the way, he's superior to the angels? That one just sort of jumps out at you saying, huh, how can this be? How can he be God of God's, imprint of God's character, the radiance of his glory, and yet you have to tell people, oh, by the way, he is superior to the angels in case you hadn't guessed. But it gets even more puzzling in verses 5 and 6. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So here you have an additional puzzling element. This great God, this amazing person is begotten and is brought into the world. And perhaps that's where the things begin to come together. Now, it's possible that there were many Jews at that time that were worshiping angels. There's different hints of that in various ancient contexts. So that may be part of the problem, that perhaps there were people in the church that were saying, well, Jesus is not truly God, but he's just a great angel that God sent down to us. But it's clear that in this lesson, the moment when God says he's superior to the angels, the moment when he says, let all the angels worship him, the moment when he says, you are begotten, that's the moment when Jesus is brought into the world. It's the incarnation of Jesus that is in view here. And there's a bit more. In fact, there's a whole lot more behind this, but we'll get to that in just a moment. First, Larry. From what we know about the fragmentation of the philosophy and teaching of Judaism at the time of Christ, because there was people that didn't believe in the resurrection, we, we don't have a whole list of the conflicts that they had going on, at least not in Scripture. But as you've mentioned, the worshiping of angels and the fact that there could have very well have been a large group that believed that there was really only one God, not that the Godhead is one, but there really is only one, and therefore the Messiah had to have been something less than the big God, even though Isaiah calls him all of these names because of the twisted view that they've had. I mean, could that be part of the reason why this is a conflict? Because we only see the letter that's addressing a conflict. We don't actually have the storyline of what the conflict is. Could he be a trying to address that? Because I do get confused myself if it's just reading this in its individual context without knowing the big picture behind it. I think the author of Hebrews will actually flesh out that big picture here shortly. And so I think that was an excellent question that maybe we hold aside for just a little bit. We don't know fully what the author is addressing in terms of the local situation, or it may be simply a general epistle addressed to Jewish Christians in general. But clearly something is going on that isn't obvious on the surface to us, and we need to dig a little deeper. And that's what I would like to do today, to share a deeper concept of the sonship throughout Scripture. So what was the bigger picture that Hebrews is addressing here? And I'd like to begin with 2 Samuel 7 and verses 12 to 14, which is what the language of verses 5 and 6 seem to be quoting. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, 
and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings. All right, you can see the echoes here that Hebrews 1, 5, and 6 is expressing. And what we have here is a prophetic speech to David, who has not got long to live, but God is speaking to him about his future. And he's saying that out of you, David, will come someone who will be much greater. And you have echoes here of Solomon, but you also have echoes here of the Messiah yet to come. It's not clear at this point in the Old Testament, but the hints are there. And so the sonship here is not a physical relationship so much as a declaration of royalty. God says, I will adopt the king. The king is David's son, but God says, I will adopt him. He will become my son. So this you know, you are my son, today I have begotten you, is not the language of God saying, I physically fathered this person, but rather saying, this day I am appointing him to this royal role. So you have here the adoption of a ruler, and this was common, by the way, in the Roman world as well, the idea that when a person became emperor, they were adopted by the gods to be their representatives on this earth. So this strange language of Hebrews is related to an original context and echoes back to 2 Samuel 7, where the Messiah and Solomon are both in view as products on the one hand of the human race, but at the same time adoption by God. What we need to do is to tackle the entire scripture in a nutshell here as to what is going on in Hebrews. What is this sonship all about? The concept of Jesus as son, as begotten of God, not in the physical sense, that's a misunderstanding that has led to some strange doctrines, but in this royal sense, what is going on with the sonship? If we go to number three, it says the concept of sonship is central to the book of Hebrews because it is a major theme of scripture as a whole. Now let's explore the biblical background of this concept. And uh, what follows there is I'm sharing you the texts that we will be going through. And I want to take you on a quick journey through the Old Testament so that we can begin to get an understanding of this sonship concept. Because as I tell you, it's going to blow the gaskets off when you get to all the way through, because this just opens up windows that we would not expect. So let's start with Adam. Adam was God's son back in the beginning. Let's go to Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, here's an interesting concept. It doesn't speak of angels being in the image of God. It speaks of human beings in the image of God. And what is the image of God? It is love. It is freedom. It is rule. It is the power to create. So God has created a new kind of creature here in Genesis 1, one that is as much like God as any creature can be. Human beings will never carry God's essence, but they can carry his likeness and his character, and they can be as much like God as any creature can be. So God, in setting up this world, creates a new kind of creature. It is something that God has special plans for, as we will see. Go to Genesis 5.3. When Adam had lived for 130 years... He became the father of a son in his likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. So here you see that Adam has a son in his image, in his likeness, reflecting the language of Genesis 1. So God's purpose was to create not just a new kind of creature, but a whole race of creatures that would be different than what he had done before. And God placed them on this earth with the intention that they would grow from generation to generation, 
that they would be fruitful and multiply, and they would expand the circle of love and joy and peace that God had within the Godhead. So God, in setting up the human race, instead of creating a planet and filling it with creatures, he could have done that. He filled the earth with animals. He could have done that. But instead, God chose to create just two and then gave them the power to create the others. So God is clearly doing something special because as far as we know, angels have no reproductive power. God is creating a new kind of creature that has abilities that have not been seen before. And what is God's purpose in doing this? God's purpose certainly was to expand whatever it was he began with Adam and Eve into a whole race of people who would be planet-wide. But an interruption to that plan came in. Genesis 3, the serpent and Eve and Adam and the fruit. We don't need to read that text. Uh, We read it often and we're familiar with it. But there came an interruption to God's plan for the human race. God had something planned, but it got interrupted. So let's go to verse 315, because God doesn't just write off the human race at this point, but he decides to intervene. Genesis 315. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So God tells them that this interruption would not be forever, that God would intervene, and he would intervene with a second Adam. He would intervene with someone who would come right from the line of Adam and Eve. God was not going to bring an intervention from outside, but he was going to bring it in within this new race. In fact, that person would be born into this race. Now think of it. God could have sent Jesus to this earth as a unique creation. Instead, he said, no, I'm going to stick with the plan. I have a plan for these human beings, and I will intervene within the race rather than from outside the race. The promise that I make will be fulfilled by a human being. That won't be Seth. He's not the one, but I will intervene, and I will intervene within the human race and within that place. So you see already in Genesis, God has a special plan for the human race. It's interrupted, but God already has a plan to deal with the interruption, and he's going to deal with it from within rather than from without. All right, Rusty? What was that enmity? What caused it? Was it information that they got? It appears that in accepting the serpent's lies, they altered their own reality, and they were no longer the same as what they were before. They were now in the image also of the serpent. So it was a distortion of the plan that God had in mind, and it was necessary that they be alienated from that, how did we put it, this interruption. They need to be alienated from this rival of God in order to truly achieve what the human race was intended to achieve. And so God says, in a nutshell, one could write volumes on it, and people have, but what God says in a nutshell is you have, in a sense, compromised the plan and potentially destroyed it but I will set in motion within the human race operations that will undo that plan and ultimately separate you, create a distance between you and this enemy who would undermine the human race. So we go now to Abraham, the story of sonship. Adam is that first son of God. Now we come to Abraham, Genesis 12, 1 to 3, expands on Genesis 3. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All right. The specific language is not here, but it is clear that these three promises to Abraham address the three relationships that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 1.26, I didn't point to that, but we have talked about this before, that image of God implies a relationship between human beings and God, that male and female implies relationship among human beings, And that dominion over the earth implies relationship with the earth. So Adam and Eve have these three relationships to God, 
to each other and to the earth. And the God's promises to Abraham are to be a blessing, first of all. That relationship between God and human beings would be restored through Abraham. He would become a great nation, which relates to the relationship between Adam and Eve. It is through their companionship, through their marriage, that the race is populated. And God will create out of that race a nation. And then it says, I will send him to a land. So just as the dominion over the earth was damaged, God's promises to Abraham are a restoration of what was lost in the Garden of Eden. In other words, God, through Abraham's seed, through Abraham's family, is going to restore his original purpose. The promises of God will be fulfilled through the family of Abraham. In Genesis, they'd be fulfilled through the descendants of Adam. But now God narrows it to a family that would be the source of God's intervention. Exodus 4 verse 22 to 23. And this is a startling statement for us today, but it fits into this larger mentality of the Old Testament. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. I say to you, let my son go that he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go. Now I will kill your firstborn son. So here you see God embracing Israel as his son. In other words, God would intervene, not just by a descendant of Adam, not just in Abraham's family, but through a nation, God would fulfill his promises to the world. That nation would be the means that God intervenes and restores what was lost. Let's read Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So here we see there to be a kingdom of priests. God has chosen to fulfill his promises through the nation as a kingdom of priests to the other nations. But Israel is not only a nation, it is God's son. This language of sonship, this language of adoption is carried through in all of this. And that brings us to David. We read 2 Samuel 7 earlier, but let's look at Psalm 89, which picks up on Genesis 3 in relation to David. Psalm 89 and verses 19 and 20. Then you spoke in a vision to your faithful one and said, I have set the crown on one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. So here we see David as the special anointed son of God, and that's clarified in verses 26 and 27 of the same chapter. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. David clearly wasn't the firstborn of Jesse but he is adopted as God's firstborn, God's chosen king of Israel. So we see this sonship concept. Today, I have begotten you. That was in 2 Samuel 7, where God is speaking to David there. But here he uses that same language, building on Genesis 3 and God's promise of enmity between the woman and the serpent, that David is part of that chain. This concept of sonship that Hebrews is getting into, has this whole lineage of background in mind. Let's go to Psalm 2, verses 5 through 7. And again, this is speaking of David. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. So if you read Hebrews blindly, you know, just by itself. A lot of what's going on in that first chapter is is very puzzling and very difficult to understand, but it's part of this whole channel of royalty, adoption, etc. And then beneath that even is the whole idea of God using sonship, adoptive sonship, all the way through 
from the time of Adam to the time of Abraham to the time of David. And we've already noted in 2 Samuel 7, the reference to Solomon, that Solomon is God's adopted son. And so the promise was going to be fulfilled through descendants of Adam. It was going to be fulfilled through the family of Abraham. It was going to be fulfilled through the nation of Israel. It was going to be fulfilled through David and his line. And with 2 Samuel 7, the promise will be fulfilled through a royal line. In other words, the day will come when one will be born of David and Solomon's descendants, and that one would be God's intervention to restore the human race to what had been lost. So God would anoint someone. That's where Messiah comes from. The Hebrew word Mashiach means the anointed one. God would anoint someone to restore humanity to God's original purpose. We haven't yet decided exactly what that is, but we're coming to it. God will restore humanity through an anointed one, but he would restore it from the inside with human genes. He would restore humanity from the inside. Evidently, there is something special about humanity worth redeeming. We don't read specifically that God moved into redemptive action because of the fall of Satan, but he does so here. There's something special at stake here that cannot be allowed to be overturned. And so God will go to drastic measures as needed in order to accomplish his purpose for humanity. Michael. A question, and that is, did the Jewish concept of Messiah mean that the Messiah would be God himself or just an anointed, very special human being? I don't think the texts that we have read require one to read that. Yeah, I think that's something that came into the consciousness of Christians once they had encountered Jesus and went beyond his humanity to say, what else is going on with these miracles and the resurrection and everything else? So I I think that it is left open at this point. It is God's son, but God's son at that point is not necessarily. He is son because God has adopted him as a human being. So I don't think that this line of thinking requires the divinity, but that uh, divinity is accepted on other grounds, as we've already seen in chapter one. Bob? Are you suggesting that God's plan was interrupted, but will resume? That's almost what it sounded like. Yes, yes. I'd say that's a pretty fair description that God has a plan for the human race. That plan was interrupted, but it will be resumed one day as God intervenes to undo the damage that has been done. Colette? Your comment about Jesus using human genetics, actually, to save us from within the human race just kind of brought up a question in me, because I've never thought of it that way before. What's the significance of that? I mean, because he could have come as God and not taken on humanity. No wonder the devil is enraged against us. But is there some sort of significance I'm still not grasping I I think you're getting a lot. (laughs) You're getting a lot. And the whole point is there's something about the human race. God had a special plan for the human race, and it was a stunning plan. And by the way, if someone are wondering what I meant by blow the gaskets off, it's just a metaphor that's basically saying you have an engine so powerful that the car blows up kind of. (laughs) And sometimes our brains feel like they're blowing up, right? So that's just an expression that an auto enthusiast might use to just say this concept of sonship has implications that go beyond anything I'd thought of before I studied for this session today. All right, Terry. Well, my understanding is that this world and therefore humankind was created after sin entered the universe. So my question is, does that mean then that was this world and humankind part of the demonstration of the way that God answered the accusations that had been made against him? That sounds good to me. Yes. God had a special plan for the human race. Would it have happened anyway? That's the interesting question that I think stretches a little beyond the information that we have. But let's see this through, and then let's come back to several of these comments and thoughts as we try to put it all together. Let's go to number four. And in number four, we get to the New Testament, where Jesus is God's son, and start to piece it together from that perspective, that Jesus is the one who was a descendant of Adam, who was of the family of Abraham, who was of Israel, 
who was of the line of David, who was the line of Solomon, etc. He comes, and we can start with Luke 3, verses 21 and 22. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Do you remember the bat kol, that voice from heaven? God meets people where they are. That's how Jews of the time expected God to show up, with a voice from heaven. So what a beautiful God. It just blends right into what the people know and what they need. And what does he declare? Jesus is my son today. I've begotten him, and I'm well pleased in him. This is the son that pleases me. This is the one the human that I was looking for, the ideal human, the one in whom my purpose can be achieved. And what is, I think, exciting here is that in Jesus, you actually had debates in the early church. Was Jesus' adoption at birth or at baptism? Okay. And I would say Hebrews sort of suggests it's at birth that God says, this is my son. But in Luke 3, it's at baptism that God says, this is my son. And I would put the two together and say, there was an announcement in heaven when Jesus was born so that the heavenly intelligences would understand this baby's a little different. Watch this one. This is part of my big plan. But that announcement now is made to human beings at the Jordan River when Jesus is baptized by John. And Luke seems to know what he's doing here because notice verse 38 of the same chapter. Son of Enos, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. So Luke has a genealogy of Jesus, and he ends that genealogy, unlike Matthew, who ends it with Abraham, he ends it with Adam. And so he sees the sonship of Jesus as a natural follow-through on what happened all the way back with Adam. So Jesus is seen, the sonship of Jesus is the way that God will intervene and undo the interruption in his plan and restore it back to where it was before. We see echoes of Genesis in Luke 1, verses 34 and 35. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. All right, so here you have another announcement, and this is announcement privately to Mary, which would echo perhaps the time in heaven when God was announcing his plan to come through the Messiah. You have echoes here of Genesis because it says the power of the highest will overshadow you. If you remember at creation, how did it all begin? The Spirit of God overshadowed the waters. This is a very interesting term. Spirit of God overshadowed the waters. Now the Spirit of God overshadows Mary. When the Spirit overshadows the world, what happens? Creation. When the Spirit overshadows Mary, there is a new creation. God is in a small sense starting over, but he's starting over in a way that includes that which was interrupted and that which was lost. So the Son of God here echoes the Genesis story. Jesus was going to live the purpose that God had for humanity all along. If you remember Jesus in the Old Testament, Jesus had a perfect relationship with God in which he was always obedient to God, always obeyed his commandments, always followed him, listened to his voice. He was the ideal human being in relationship with God. He was the ideal human being in service to others, washing feet, doing miracles, healing the sick, etc. And he was Adam, as Adam was intended to be in relation to the earth, he had command over the winds and the waves. He could sit on an unbroken colt and it would know its master. He could direct fishermen to massive catches. He had dominion over the fish of the sea. So Adam, Jesus was sent to live out the purpose God had for humanity all along. And we become part of that story when we are born again. Born again means born into relationship with Jesus Christ, becoming part of this story of restoration that God has in mind. One other text to put with that, and that is Romans 8, 29. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. So once again, it speaks of God's son and being conformed to the image of his son. Jesus is what the image of God was always supposed to be. Jesus is what the human race was supposed to be like. This was God's plan for humanity, that it would reflect the image of God to the universe. And in Jesus now, God is showing what that humanity was like, the purpose that God had for that humanity. And all who are in Christ are being conformed to the image of Jesus, just as Adam was in the image of God. So we see that in Christ, God's purpose for humanity was beginning to be seen and was being restored. But we still haven't answered the question, what is that purpose? Why is this so important to the author of Hebrews? Let's go there to Hebrews. And this is number five. We'll come back to Hebrews and we will read Hebrews 1, 5, and 6 again. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So God brings his son into the world, but his son is superior to the angels. Think about that. Jesus is a human being, but he's superior to the angels. Is that an implication of what God is trying to do with the human race? Because as a human being, he is superior to the angels. We'll hold that thought for a moment and let Michael speak. Yes, in verse 6, it says, we'll worship him. Only God is worshipped. Mm-hmm. And so that implies he is part of the Godhead, necessarily. Mm -hmm. But is the fact that he's superior to angels have any implications for what God has planned for human beings? Yes, we are not image of God in essence, but we are image of God in other ways. Terry? What all of that makes me think of is that in heaven, there was a point when God had to set Jesus before the angels and say, actually, He is God. He is my son. Because to the angels, Jesus became as an angel, which says to me, Jesus became something that they could understand, that they could relate with. On the same hand, Jesus came to this earth as a human so that we could see him, understand him, and relate in a context that makes sense to us. That's correct. But in his humanity, what are we learning about God's purpose for humanity? All right, Bob. Well, there's a question you kind of raised a minute ago. What does it mean to be the image of God? Because it sounds like we've always just assumed ever since grade school, we had classes, we were to somehow look like God and that's what it is. But now I'm questioning whether our understanding of the image of God is what we were taught in grade school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what it means at this point. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm delighted that you all recognize that we're not doing grade school here. <laughs> yes. And these are tough things. We've been wrestling the last couple sessions. There's stuff that, that's why I was saying, you know, blow the gaskets or, or blow the mind or something there. There are things that are bigger than we can grasp. And Hebrews is pushing us in one of those directions. Larry. And I think it was Terry that asked the question about God had to get the angels together and remind them of the relationship that Christ was playing in what was going on in heaven. So in that light, is it possible that as we see the progression of Christ as he matures and moves through his ministry on earth to his ministry in heaven, Christ is showing what could have happened, that humanity is destined for something much greater than what we think that we have been set out for. Is that where you're trying to suggest? And if so, I think that's very interesting. I think Ellen White in one place says that in Christ, humanity is incorporated into divinity, that humanity is elevated into the Godhead in Jesus Christ. If he just adopted humanity and then discarded it, that would be one thing. But he took his humanity back with him into eternity. And that begins to stir up our minds to understand. All right, Dan. I really appreciate what you're saying, John. I've always been afraid to verbalize some of the things you're talking about because it's so expansive and not only expansive, but the responsibilities associated with what you're talking about are really quite humbling. It's humbling in the sense that 
God would share some of the things that almost no one would consider sharing. Who would want to share the kind of responsibility, the kind of power, the kind of reputation with people as frail as we are? It says something really quite wonderful about the unselfishness about God and actually the ideal that God had for all of us, even in our present state and what he hopes to help us to attain in the hereafter. I've always been reluctant to talk about the magnitude of what God has envisioned for us, because it just seems too much, at least for me, too much for me to share with other people, because it just seems like too much pie in the sky, or it seems like it's just too much. I really appreciate the fact that you're sort of bringing us there to get somewhat of a grasp of what God has planned for us. It would be too much for me, too, except that the author of Hebrews is explicit, and I didn't really see that before the last few weeks. So I'm sharing something that is just kind of like, that's really there. I went to the Greek and like, what? Wow, I can't believe this. Amazing. So we will get to that shortly. But first, Rusty. In the latter half of verse five, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. Is that suggesting, in a sense, you know the original language, is that suggesting that they're taking on these roles? Because we believe, I mean, I believe, and Ellen White says also that if the father would have come down, it would have been the same story. I know many people don't quite get that. And I'm wondering, is this a scripture I could use to illustrate that they are taking on roles that they didn't previously have pre-Advent? I think you can, but you would need to do it in the light of the whole progression that we covered. In other words, Hebrews is building on 2 Samuel. Hebrews is building on Psalm 2. Hebrews is building on Genesis 3. That whole progression was necessary in order for us to begin to see what you are seeing in this text. So yeah, I think you can use it for that purpose, but it won't make a lot of sense to people unless they've been given the steps to get there. Colette? This whole new wave of awareness is kind of coming into my thinking. You know, you mentioned that there were three areas of relationship between man and God and between male and female and other people and between people in the earth. And I remember reading somewhere where Ellen White talks about Jesus's relationship with the Father is one that we can have, which seems way out of grasp for me at this point. But listening to what you're saying about what the author of Hebrews is saying is, it seems like that's God's whole plan for us, that his whole plan for us was to have these enhanced relationships with the earth and with creation and with people and with God himself. And to me, it just opens up a whole new world of thinking and how we relate to everything in our beliefs, in the scriptures, and in what God has in store for us. And it's like, oh, <laughs> you know, a whole nother level of explosion. It was worth saying, Colette, that when you're getting into stuff like this, saying it five different ways is helpful because it helps each person to get a kind of a grasp of what is happening here. Sean? To the Jewish Christian, Hebrews 1 would have been comforting and directive, even as we are being comforted and directed here as we work through this. But what would have been the fallout to the larger Jewish community with this kind of a distinct explanation of Jesus and his place and role here in this plan of salvation? I think what was deeply offensive about the Jesus message was it was disruptive of the system. There was a system that was put into place. I like to put it this way. Religion is a human response to the perception of God's presence and direction. Human beings experience God, and then they create an institution to memorialize that and to make efficient the spreading of the message about that event throughout the world. And in that sense, religion's a beautiful thing because religion is the best thing human beings can do to respond to God, to say, let's organize ourselves to make this the center of everything. Sadly, over time, religious institutions become more focused on their own survival as institutions than on the original message. And when Jesus came, he had this expansive vision for Judaism, which was so exciting that, as we said, could blow the gaskets off and point us in a wholly new direction that is fantastic, but it might mean the disruption or even destruction of some of the old structures. And human beings are married to those structures. They don't want to be separated. There's security there, you see? And so a message as expansive as the Jesus message is inevitably going to be opposed. Think of Rome. 
there's a whole structure and a system. They had an eschatology. They had an origin story, the same kind of thing. So you had a clash in the Roman Empire between these two worlds, the Jewish world and the Roman world. And Jesus came along and blew both houses down. No wonder they killed him and united to do so because he threatened them both equally. But let's get to the core, Hebrews 2. And this blew my mind. So here we are. Okay, let's read verse 5. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. All right. I read this text many times before, but suddenly it really struck me. He did not subject the world to come to angels. God says angels are not going to be in charge of the world to come. Well, who is then? Verse 6. But someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? What does this have to do with anything? He's saying, I'm going to tell you who God has subjected the future world to, who God has put in charge of the future world. And then he quotes this statement about human beings. What is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? And he's not son of man here is not Jesus in the author of Hebrews' mind, and you will see that clearly in just a minute. He's talking about human beings. He shifts his angels won't be in charge of the world to come. Human beings will. Verse 7. You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor. So here it says you've made him or them, human beings, for a little while lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. So here you see, this is not Jesus he's speaking about here. He's speaking of human beings. It is not to angels that God has subjected the world to come, but human beings who are for a time lower than angels. Certainly we feel that way now, don't we? Yet God will ultimately place them in charge of the world to come. Verse 8. Subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them. All right. That translation is a bit interpretive because the original is actually singular all the way through, but it is correctly translating in the sense that the author now is talking about the human race as a collective, him, okay, putting everything in subjection to human beings. He's left nothing outside his or their control. Not now. At present, we don't see this. Not now. But what do we see? Verse 9. But we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So here we see that Jesus is the forerunner, Hebrews 12. He's the forerunner of the human race. And he was made lower than the angels. Why? So that God's intervention would be implanted within the genetic makeup of the human race, within human genes. And as he was made lower than the angels, so human beings made lower than the angels. As he will be exalted over the angels, so will human beings be placed in charge of the world to come. So in Hebrews, there's this delicate interplay, first of what happens with Jesus, and now God's plan for the human race. One more text, Revelation 3.21. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Do you see the parallel here? Jesus, the forerunner, sat on his throne at his ascension, waiting to be joined by what? the rest of the human race on God's throne. That text is, yeah, mind-blowing, is it not? And it reminds us of 1 Peter 2, the royal priesthood. Royalty, kingship, is an ancient way of saying these are the persons who have placed in charge, the persons who are able to guide and direct that which is placed under their direction. All right, Rita? When Adam and Eve were created, they as human beings were the ones who were in charge of the earth, so to speak. I think that when they succumbed to misrepresentation of God, then they certainly then at that point became lower than the angels because heaven had already been subjected to the misrepresentation of God and God was trying to show the universe what a relationship with him was like and what it would be like, what heaven 
was made like in the first place. And after they fell, God is saying not only to Adam and Eve, but to the whole universe, this is going to be put right and I will show you my kingdom on earth, which was like what it was in the Garden of Eden, will be restored and humans again will be in charge of the world to come, both on earth and the whole of the universe. And that revelation of that relationship with God came through God's son in the same way that Adam was God's son in the first place, is how I understand it. Appreciate that very much. As we go back now to the beginning of this study, what is God's plan for the human race? If you go back to eternity past, God's highest creation was the angels. God's highest creature was Lucifer from the beginning. And yet at Eden, God was establishing a new type of creature. It is never said anywhere that I'm aware of that angels are in the image of God. God wanted to create beings that would be as much like God as it is possible for creatures to be. And not only that, angels do not procreate, according to Jesus. So the power to create little people like ourselves is a unique facet of this distinctive creation that God has made. He could have created the entire human race with a snap of his fingers. But as we know, God does things slowly because he's a great teacher. And his plan was that this earth would be a training school for the future leaders of the universe. They were as much like God as is possible for a creature to be, yet they were naive. They were inexperienced. They were like children. And God gave them a unique measure of freedom so that they could develop maturity. It would take time to develop a race of leaders, but God was prepared to take that time for them to develop maturity, leadership maturity. Why not angels? Perhaps because the angelic experience does not stretch them to the full limit that would be necessary to become humble. You know, to rule a galaxy would be a very humbling task, but at the same time, danger of pride, danger of Luciferian thoughts. And angels never having experienced the fullness of the tragedy that is this earth might not be fully prepared for the kind of task that God might want to give. God chose a race that would be prepared for this. And what I would suggest, and at this point we're taking some strong statements in Scripture and saying, what are the implications? I would suggest that the millennium is a restart on the Eden plan, that in the millennium, God's people will be developing as they would have had sin never entered the earth. Freed from sin, we begin to grapple with the deeper issues of our own personality, the deeper issues of our relationship with each other, the deeper issues with God, and also how to manage a world, how to manage a galaxy without falling apart emotionally and psychologically. God is prepared to spend plenty of time on education with the ultimate goal of a universe that is totally free and yet free from sin, an almost impossible task from our perspective. But the millennium, you have the tree of life. It says the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. The millennial will be a time of development. It'll be a time of maturing and growing. People will have fully committed for or against God before that time comes. But in the millennium, those who have committed for God will re-enter the school that got interrupted in the Garden of Eden. Humanity was designed to have the highest position in all creation. And to achieve this, human nature was grafted into the divine nature in Jesus Christ. And in relationship with him, God can achieve this ultimate goal in a way that perhaps is even grander than if sin had never happened. My heart is full you know, as I contemplate this amazing message, and I sense that you feel the same way. But let me close with a little speculation. This is not horse's mouth. This is not official from the throne or anything like that. But we've always wondered, how is it that sin ever happened? What is it that caused Lucifer to go off the rails? And I think generally the wise answer has always been, well, we don't know. Sin is a mystery. But it seems to me I haven't been able to find it, but it seems to me in some of the earlier writings of Ellen White, she describes 
a scene where the Trinity is in conference together and they're planning out this earth and Satan's not part of that conference. And if the outcome of that conference is a plan like this, Satan would say, that's usurping my place. I just wonder, I haven't found anything solid to back that up, but I just wonder, is that possibly the triggering point where Satan felt like he was being sidelined, overthrown? I don't know. That's pure speculation, but I just wanted to share that. Have you think about it? And maybe we come back to that sometime and see what we make of all that. But anyway, we are grateful for what God has set before us for sure. Let's pray. We thank you, Father in heaven. We thank you for the trust that you have placed in us, that we who have suffered so much with sin, we who have seen the depths of tragedy in this universe, that you might one day trust us to be safe with leadership, to be safe with what some would call power and authority. It blows our minds and we're grateful for it. And we pray that you would watch with us and walk with us as we seek to play the part that you have set before us for Jesus' sake. Amen.